A good morning to you all. And thank you for joining this maize harvesting and post-harvest management webinar. My name is Rollings from Agribusiness Media. At Agribusiness Media, we bridge the information gap in the agricultural industry. At no cost to you, the farmers, through our agribusiness magazine, our agribusiness directory, agribusiness talk social media platforms, and this agribusiness online television hosting these weekly webinar series. We will share links to our media platforms in the chat section. So be sure to like and follow us on social media. And also, more importantly, to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So if you're looking for information on maize harvesting and post-harvest management, you're in the right place. We're also going live on our Facebook page. The reason why we are doing this webinar is that we are now in the most satisfying and heartwarming season, a season that brings joy. And it is what we have been expecting after months of labor and sweat. However, if it is not well managed, this season can turn out to be the worst of all due to post-harvest losses. And these losses okay during and after harvesting, in grading, storage facilities, during transportation, and also in the market. Some studies around the world have shown that farmers lose up to 50% of their crop due to poor post-harvest management. So if your target was eight tons, for example, you might end up with four tons, and that's quite a significant loss. The higher percentage being in storage facilities. So there are many reasons that result in these unwanted losses of which include pests and rodents, poor facilities, poor management, lack of technical know-how, market issues, and also farmer negligence. What may also interest you is that in most communal areas of the country, Maize production is characterized by one year of good production, followed by two or three years of drought or deficit. Uh, that is why long-term post-harvest storage is very, very important. So how this webinar is going to unfold is, we're going to have informative discussion with great presentations from uh, our experts in the industry. Wendy Mazura will cover harvesting methods. Julius Agriquip will cover the need for mechanized harvesting. We will cover also reducing post-harvest losses in storage. And, th and that's Justice Chambela from ZFC. Then issues to do with the market. We know the market is key to the success of your farm businesses. So Junior Manduna, from the Agricultural Marketing Authority who cover market issues. So we will give you farmers and other participants that are joining us a chance to ask you questions. And this we factored into the program. So how it's going to work is to allow for that smooth transition between presenters. We have a question and answer section right at the end of the presenters. So if you have, uh, any question, just type in the, in the chat section. And if you're watching on Facebook, just type your question in the comment section. And also note that we are finishing by 12 p.m. latest. We would also like to encourage you to turn off your audio and video if you are not presenting to avoid interruptions. And our admins this end will also try to control that. The presenters will do a brief introduction before they go into their presentations. So we'll start off with Wendy Mazura on harvesting methods. So I'm sure we've been given the housekeeping issues and uh, I'll move straight into the gist of the presentation, which is how we can safeguard our, our sweat and hard work so that we do not lose uh, at the last end. We need to safeguard and secure our yield. So the presentation is going to be as follows. I'll start by looking at the importance of harvesting and post-harvest handling of rain. I'll then look at harvesting and harvesting preparations, harvesting time, uh, moisture, and harvesting. The hint to really talk about today. 
Then Grain, just touch briefly on protection since there are other speakers who are going to speak elaborately about that. So in Zimbabwe, did you know that 60 to 70 percent of the Zimbabwe population is dependent on agriculture for livelihoods and for the industry? And grain in Zimbabwe is used as a staple for more for, for the significant chunk of the population, with the number one cereal being maize and the second uh, most important cereal being wheat. Then, with that in mind, post harvest losses can amount to 20 to 30 percent. So this can be during harvesting or during transit periods. So it's important for us to safeguard our yields and make sure that we don't incur these avoidable losses at harvesting and post-harvesting. So there is need for you to plan ahead of the harvesting season. As much as you plan and you buy and you procure your inputs before the onset of the season, also you should be able to plan and prepare for your harvesting period before it commences. This enables you to then come in with the uh, required uh, preparation and uh, as well as the uh, making sure that the facilities that you're going to store your grain are top notch and the machinery that you're going to use for harvesting has been serviced and you don't uh, face Unnecessary setbacks or drawbacks during harvesting due to breakdowns and delays. So, planning in advance is advised. You also need to make sure that the drying facilities is not only ending with the, with the, pre with the prevention of COVID 19, but you also need to sanitize your storerooms and adopt the far for the FIFO complex where you're going to say the first in needs to get out of the storeroom first and whatever comes in last is, is what's going to come out of the, the storeroom last. So, so that you, know, you don't end up mixing your old grain with your new grain because this causes threats of introducing weevils as well as the most crops uh, like looking at maize, the varieties will mature the earliest being the earliest maturing on the market, the ultra early, very early, early, medium and late maturity in that order. But it will de de uh, depend as well on your management. If you fail to avail the necessary nutrients at the desired time and the moisture level is depleted uh, suddenly, like we are seeing now, there is a premature um, senescence the maize crop because there is a termination of the rainfall season, which was not anticipated. So that again can force harvesting and dry down to come earlier, as opposed to if the crop had been given its um, ample amount of nutrients and its requirements. So physiological maturity. What is physiological maturity? This is the stage when you're able to say, if you're looking at maize, the crop has ceased to grow. There is no more accumulation of dry matter. That crop is now just waiting for it to dry down and lose moisture. The physiological maturity period is reached when the crop is at 30 to 40% moisture content. Usually it's about 30%. So this means at that time, the moisture level is still very high for you to commence harvesting. Unless if you have drying facilities where you're going to take the grain to the dryer, or further dry down until it reaches the moisture level that is desired for a particular market. Looking at GMV, uh, the market it will desire 12.5 to around 18, 13.5% moisture, but 12.5 being the standard. So you need to dry your grain to that level. So it's important for you to know that at physiological maturity, it's the end of the dry meta accumulation. And for maize, you can tell by the formation of a black catch or a black layer on the tip of the grain. For soya bean, you can tell by the pods turning that particular grain in question, and that um, that helm is going to turn brown or take the color that is expected of that variety. Then for sorghum, you also find that there's a black layer formation, and for millet, there's a black layer formation as well. And usually at physiological maturity, that's when the dry down of the leaves is expected to start happening because the leaves will have completed their cycle of feeding the grain. So this is very important for you to take note of. 
So we have spoken about the days to maturity. You can tell your harvesting period by counting the days to maturity based on the variety that you have established, but factoring in the altitude. You can also tell by looking at the senescence aging of the plant or the physiological maturity. The third, um, or physiological maturity. Then moving on, you looking at moisture and harvesting. The effects of moisture on grain are important and you need to take note of the fact that moisture is going to accelerate the rate at which we lose the quality of our grain by promoting decay and fungal diseases. So grain that is too wet is a high risk of rapid deterioration and spoilage. Grain that is too dry is subject to damage during uh, handling and is more susceptible to shrinking insect mold and uh, also uh, some damage during storage. Here, it's important for you to note that as much as we advocate for low moisture, the desired moisture content for maize is 12.5%, which is to say below that the grain starts to deteriorate to a point where it's more susceptible to insect damage. That's when you see that there are higher incidences of, um, of weevil damage in grain that is, uh, that is at around 9% moisture or lower than that because you have let your grain to stay in the field for too long and you have made it vulnerable and susceptible to insect damage. So it's important to harvest and make sure that you take note that the grain is not too wet or too dry. Ideal moisture content levels are what we are speaking about. And for maize, it's 12.5%. For soya bean, 11%. For sorghum, 12.5%. Millets, it's 12.5% as well. And for groundnuts, it's 7%. So the effects of moisture content on grain and human health. It's also important for you to take note of the fact that there are some crops such as groundnuts, where you find that if moisture levels are not at the recommended ones, you run the risk of promoting the development of mycotoxins such as aflatoxins. And these aflatoxins are toxic and they can cause problematic diseases, particularly they are carcinogenic. So you would not want to be a trigger of a carcinogenic um, uh, development in, in consumers because of your failure to observe moisture content levels that are recommended. So for grain with high moisture content increases the rates of respiration and germination of the grain and the heat buildup, high humidity of 60 to 80% will promote fungal diseases. And it becomes a vicious cycle until by the time, if it's a silo or a, a grain silo, a, home, a homemade one, by the time you open that silo, say it's about after six months or, or 10 months, you find that the whole grain is already damaged and it's beyond, uh, uh, beyond use. So it's important for you to take note of that as well. Then looking at the harvesting methods, harvesting methods are hinged on two main pillars. The first one is hand harvesting. The second one is mechanical harvesting. We'll start with hand harvesting. In hand harvesting, it's important to note that you need also to be precise and efficient in hand harvesting methods that you are going to choose to employ so that you do not uh, incur quantity losses whereby you are leaving some of the crops on the, uh, on the stock because you are not following up and checking if it's being done thoroughly or because there is theft that is being done. Maybe one bag is going to the farmer, the other bag is finding its way out. So it's important for you to, to have the necessary checks and balances to make sure that you don't incur these losses during harvest. So the harvesting methods include the bang board trailer, where the farmer is going to be harvesting, and the trailer, which is going to be drawn by a tractor usually, is going to be following slowly on the side of the, of the lines or the rows that are being harvested. And on both sides of the, of the trailer, there are going to be people who are walking inside the lines, throwing the cob that they will have plugged out of, plugged off the stock into the trailer so that the trailer at the end of that cycle is able to upload at a particular point. The important thing to note here is that during this bank board trailer harvesting method, you need to make sure that the trailer and the tractor are moving in contender with the people who are harvesting on both sides. And also you need to make sure that your, the number of people you have on either side of the trailer are not too many to an extent that when they throw the the, the cob, it fails to fall into the trailer because maybe that person is at a, a, a far end. So we recommend six, six rows, uh, uh, six or less rows on both sides of the trailer for it to be effective. Then there's a drum or set and a trailer where you find that the people will be moving in with a tray with a with a drum 
or with sex and throwing in their 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 harvested cobs into the sex and usually they offload they they drop them off at particular points then someone else with a trailer will be following to pick those bags from that particular point and take it to the next of they maybe it's shelling maybe it's feather dry down depending on the moisture level that will have been um present at the time of harvesting the other one is using empty bags or sacks the grain is just uh, the cobs are just harvested thrown straight into the bags some of them are dehulled dehusked and thrown into the bags some of them are thrown with the husks and then they are taken to the uh, storage facility where they will be stored so for hand harvesting of soya bean you you are going to come in with uh, with the sickle and you're going to be cutting at the base making sure that you do not leave any grain in the field so you need to cut taking note of the um, of the of the distance that is between the ground and the the the, the cobs which we uh, also advocate for when you select your varieties so it's important to cut and make sure that you're not leaving anything in the field just to mention that for soya bean it's important to know the moisture level as well because soya bean undergoes what we call pod shattering so if you come in late the cobs the, the, the pods are going to open up and throw the grain onto the ground so you incur, you are going to incur losses through gleaning as well as losses through failure to harvest all your grain from the field so it's important for you to take note of that as well then moving on to the mechanical methods of harvesting the mechanical methods include mostly the use of a combine harvester and the tractor this is for the resource endowed farmers who are going to then come in with that um, uh, mechanized facility which is precise which is efficient depending on whether or not it was saved this time if you're going to hire it make sure that it's in tandem with the raw spacing that you established your crop it you are looking at maize it's so big because you don't want a situation where you establish your rows at 90 centimeters and you get a harvester that comes at 75 centimeters what it simply means is you're going to leave some of your lines lying down you incur losses by looking for people to come in again and uh go through those lines so you also don't want to incur losses and gleaning as well so it's important to check not that bring harvesting and also looking at um, harvesting mechanically, you also need to take note of the fact that uh, the if it's going to be maize, if it's going to be soya bean, if that crop is going to, to be lying on the ground, then there are going to be challenges in you having to come in with cleaning. So this is going to be a cost, and it might also be a challenge. The, the combine harvester might have um, uh, breakdowns because it's going very low on the ground. Because of the the gleaning that you're trying to, to to make sure that you do and uh, harvest as much as you can. So if the in areas where you find that that crop maybe it was affected by by termites and uh, the the stalks are lying down, you might need to keep people there to harvest those particular areas so that your harvester does not have a lot of delays trying to harvest that crop that is not standing up right. So you, before you start harvesting, you also need to check your moisture content and make sure that it's at the desired level. You can only do this efficiently by taking your grain to GMB, or if you have a moisture meter, you can check for the moisture level. This is the most efficient way of doing so. Though there are some traditional methods that uh, some farmers can use, uh, maybe they can uh, uh, just um, um, cut a small piece with their tooth there of the grain and check if it's dry enough and check if there's any moisture level some they can put the grain into a tin, maybe it's a tin of jam, a tin, a tin of peanut butter used, then they shake it up. So there's a, a specific sound that comes with dry grain that is different from grain that still has a lot of moisture. So these are some of these cult cultural methods that can be used as well. So moving on, uh, looking at the, the drying methods, the drying methods um, are important. So you can dry at a, a small scale or at a communal level, where after harvesting, you can further dry your cobs um, in, a, in a crow that you'll have erected for a crib, which is going to allow for wind or air to be moving or circulating in that structure and further dry down the grain to the desired moisture. What's important here is for you to make sure that the, the, that structure is not sitting directly on the ground, is this causes threats of moisture being absorbed by the grain 
and promoting disease development, you also need to make sure that you, safe, you safeguard it from, um, uh, from challenges of, uh, of death, because this is also a quantity loss. You need to safeguard your brain against that itself. So other, um, other people are going to just um, spread the grain over a, a rock surface. And uh, this also can be a method of drying. Some are going to put it on the roof surface of, um, of, of their structures of their homes so that it can get the dry down until it reaches the dried moisture level. Looking at ground nuts, you are going to erect a specific structure, um, a, a, triangle, a triangular shaped structure where you're going to be putting the, um, uh, the ground nuts to dry down in a specific way. And you're going to see in the pictures that we are going to share. Then there are artificial dryers that can be used as well, moving with technology and advancements of uh, innovations that are aimed at reaching precision. So you're going to come in with a dryer. So with, some farmers have these dryers. If, um, these examples are of the 600 seeds drying facility, which is in Mount Hamden, which you can send your grain to for further drying to the desired moisture level. So these are some of the advanced technologies that are going to be done where air, heat, well, heat and air are going to be forced onto the grain and forced it to dry down to the desired level. So um, this is the drying. Um, these are the drying methods that can be done by the farmers. That is a traditional uh, way of drying it. Uh, in Shokona, it's called Edara. As you can see, as we were explaining, that it's raised, not on the, directly on the ground. It's opened on, on all ends, on all sides, so that uh, there's good movement of air. And uh, I'm sure there's a way to inspect. As you can see, the gentleman there is going in to inspect. So you also need to be able to inspect. Some of them are dangerous. So you need to also take your pick and choose what works for you in line with the facilities of storage that you have. But um, you also need to make sure that you are using methods that are efficient. In terms of grain storage, stored, grain can be stored in different ways can be stored in, um, in the silos, it can be bagged, it can also be stored um, in, uh, in different uh, traditional structures that you can erect or in bins. Currently, they talk about metal, metal silos that are just medium sized. You can put it in, in, at a communal homestead and put your grain there. So the trick with this one is that it's uh, also going to, to safeguard against uh, fungal damage, fungal infestation, insect infestation, because it's airtight. So this is another structure that you can consider. Put, and it's also durable because it's a metal style that can be used. And bulk storage is what we're referring to. In bulk storage, you just need to make sure that there is a way for you to regularly check and uh, offload the grain when need be. And you are employing the FIFO concept that we referred to, first in, first out, so that you don't use new grain at the expense of the old grain that is in the silo. So the grain storage structures uh, in pictures are, is highlighted where we have GMB, um, our mother body for the storage of our grain. We have uh, a Dura structure or rural granary, and we have the metal silo that I was explaining and the bulk storage of the baked grain. And on the baked grain, the bulk storage, you need to check and take note of the fact that there is a raised uh, platform from the ground there where the um, um, pellets, uh, wooden pellets that are preventing direct contact of the, of the grain and the ground and on the walls as well so that there is no moisture absorption. So in conclusion, it's important for you to do pre and post harvest checks and make sure that you don't incur losses. You do not want to lose 30 to 40 percent of your grain due to harvest and post harvest losses. Also make sure that transit losses are avoided as you transport your grain to the next point. We have to check include machinery, readiness and calibration, drying and storage facilities. Make sure that you have made the necessary um, corrections and adjustments of your storage facility. If it's mending the roof, if it's sealing some cracks and crevices on the ground, make sure it's done well in advance. Different crops have different uh, physiological maturity indicators that farmers should also take note of. Then you need also to make sure that you take note of the right moisture level to avoid fungal, uh, fungal diseases from developing, and you don't want your grain to be too wet and too dry. Grain moisture plays an important role in the vicious cycle 
of quality depletion in grain. You need to harvest in two different ways. Either you are hand harvesting or you are machine harvesting, but you need to be guided by the principles of efficiency for either one of the two. Drying can be natural or artificial and protecting the grain is important using methods that are not going to be harmful to you when you're using that, uh, that grain and that, also, that are also going to safeguard your grain for the longest period, depending on the period that you want to store your grain for. So in conclusion, I would like to end by quoting the words of uh, the Crop Life Society of Zimbabwe. And they say, once in your life, you need a preacher, you need a teacher, you may need a doctor, you may need a lawyer, but every day you need a farmer because two or three times or four times even a day, you're going to eat. So as farmers, you are important. So let's safeguard and make sure that we secure our yield and don't incur unnecessary harvest and, trans uh, and transit and post-harvest losses. Thank you so much. Indeed, uh, that was a great pre uh, presentation. Thanks, Wendy. And uh, it's, it's true that we need uh, a farmer on a daily basis. Thank you very much for, for the great presentation and for covering the key issues to do with uh, uh, harvesting maize uh, and preventing post-harvest losses. So our next presenter is Tondera Iniza. He's with Julie's Agri. Uh, he's, he's going to cover uh, the need for mechanized harvesting. Uh, you can go for it. Yes, I was taking on the advantages of, of mechanical harvesting. I am Tondrai Bisa. I come from Julie Agrikip. Uh, we are under the um, branch of in Zimbabwe. Mechanized harvesting uh, is a method. It eliminates grain loss during manual cutting of the crop or trying to tie the crop for carrying transportation, the harvest of uh, incomplete threshing. Then mechanical harvesting is also chosen primarily to take advantage of flat and small slope lands and needs big investments in equipment that may always appreciate among many growers and which can be depreciated by efficiency and labor cost reduction. Mechanical harvesting machines can be broadly classified as conduct machines and mass removal machines. That I mean, we as duly aggressive as us in Zimbabwe, we have uh, these mechanical machines which actually help farmers to have a reduction in all these uh, crop losses. Uh, we have a KO1 maize shaler, which is mostly used to shell uh, seed maize. And it can also do on grains. Uh, the reason why it's mostly used on, on seed maize is it is an efficient rate of 99.9% on crushing maize. It doesn't crush maize. Uh, the power requirement is 10, between 10 and 25 horsepower tractor. It can pull it because it's PTO driven. If it's mechanical, it's, if it's electrical driven, it can use, it needs 7.5 to 19 kilowatt, kilowatt, kilowatts. The output for the shelling capacity is two to four times per hour. Then it also is an efficient suction winnow, which which allows it to produce a clear sample. It is a, a convenient begging outlet. This is, if you can see my screen, this is the area where there is a begging outlet. Then it's all. It also has got a grain saver visit to the cob exit, where the cob exit there is a grain saver there. Its mass is around say 117 kgs. So the tractor requirement that is needed is very small. It means it uses a small uh, fuel consumption. Then we have uh, another one as known as the K2 maize shaler. This we, are, we strongly recommend it for commercial maize farmers. It can shell and peeled maize like mango bisaba mashanga, amsatmachi furura. Then Mongo is Momo into Visa is a Then the Smagorin was a quasi You know, once I could produce a EO four to five times an hour. For the purposes of transporting this, we also have a farm trailer which you can use to transport your maize from the farm to where you want to shell it. It also uses a tractor, a six meter farm trailer, it has a carrying capacity of five tons. It, it has a ten table friction type on the front wheels, turning front wheels. Over and above this, on carrying the uh, 
maize from the fields. We're saying using this tractor, this tractor which you can also use to shell. I said we need 19 to 25 horsepower on the shellers, but you can even big, use a bigger. That simply means the fuel consumption will increase also. Uh, right now we have a trader that's on offer. It's a T T75 for the trader going for 21,300, but it's only on special offer. That's why I've thought of putting it here. Mm, I think I'm done off now. I'll entertain questions. Okay, uh, thanks Tunderai for your presentation. May we invite Justice Chambela, is with ZFC, cover on reducing post-harvest losses in storage. Justice Chambela, you can go for it. Um, greetings to you all. Uh, my name is Murinisi Justice Chambela, an agronomist with ZFC Limited. And today we are going to be sharing on reducing post-harvest losses um, during storage. At ZFC, we are mandated to help you get a better crop in every farming venture that you do. And you have currently opened an online store where you can buy your fertilizers and your chemicals and also have live interactions that will help you get a better crop. So the outline of the presentation is that I'm going to have um, an, a brief introduction and I'll move on to storage paste cultural measures, and also the use of grain protectants in storing of our maize. You will see that the farming approach has moved, has now been focused on an integrated pest management um, approach whereby we have the cultural, we also have the physical, we also have the chemical control uh, measures. So let's just get um, straight into it. Can you imagine after an investment by the farmer of agricultural chemicals, fertilizers, and even conquering for armyworm, a menace to production, then the farmer loses his all at storage. The farmer loses his harvest um, at storage due to um, post-harvest losses or due to storage space. That would be so hateful, and that would be an entire um, season's effort going down the drain. You will see that um, unlike for armyworm, we are able to identify, you know, um, the symptoms, you know, the damage um, at an early stage. But when it comes to these post-harvest losses and these storage pests, um, the farmer only identifies um, the, the damage probably after six months, which will mean that an entire season's effort would have gone down the drain, which really, you know, um, advocates for the importance of maize grain protection and storage. You will see that um, in maize, there are major pests that include the larger grain borer, um, which is also referred to as the gonyet um, by the local farmers, the grain um, weevil, which we sometimes um, term with chipukuto. We also have the red flower beetle and also the lesser grain borer. So you can see that the, large, the larger grain borer has been termed the gonyet because it tends you know, to cause a lot of damage. It consumes almost everything. It can even consume wood. We also have chipukuto, which is also a menace um, to production. We also have the red flower beetle, and we also have the lesser grain borer. Um, when distinguishing between the lesser grain borer and the larger grain borer, you will see that it's in terms of the structure. The larger grain borer um, tends to have a sharp edge, whereas the lesser grain borer has um, a slope, a much gentle slope. So you will see that um, maize with a, ma with a moisture content of above 12.5 degrees Celsius will not be affected by the storage pest. It is the maize which has a moisture content of 12.5 degrees Celsius and below that will be affected um, by the storage pest. So you will see that um, farmers have the misconception of saying that um, and they tend to blame it on the variety. Whereas um, we are saying that um, um, varieties 
The farmer should be aware that you know the early maturing variety will, will mature earlier than a late maturing um, variety. And the practice now has been to harvest all maize at the same time. So the farmer will harvest their early maturing variety. Then they will also harvest their late maturing um, variety at the same time. And when this happens, you see that um, the early maturing variety has already matured, has already passed the 12.5 degrees Celsius and is now being affected um, by the storage pests such as Zipuguto. So all maize varieties do not uh, mature at the same time. The early maturing variety will, will mature earlier and the late maturing variety will um, mature a bit later um, in the season. So we encourage farmers to observe um, these cultural practices. They should harvest on time. Let's not um, harvest all varieties at the same time. Let us have our records and see when our planting date is and when the harvesting um, time is going to be. We also recommend um, the farmer to shell the maize. You see that um, shelled maize is much easier to store as compared to unshelled uh, maize. Maize stored as cobs is difficult to treat as compared to maize that has been shelled. And you see that um, the larger grain borer tends to favor um, the, the maize, which has not been shelled, which is on the cob, and the larger grain borer will feed on the cob and also on the maize grain. So maize that has not been shelled is much more vulnerable to attack by the larger grain borer, which is sometimes termed as the gonyet. So we encourage the farmer not to mix the old grain with the new grain. That is say, go red with it, rangara tulangwa, aside, and let us now look for a new place um, to store our grain. We also recommend the farmer to use, you know, clean bags as opposed to masaga at a garati now. And our warehouse, our silos should always be clean. Let us clean our silos and let us remove any um, residues or even debris that is within our silos. And we are advocating for the use of of grain protectant, especially to maize that has um, reached a percentage of 12.5. As ZFC, we offer a grain protectant um, termed actelic gold dust. You will see that um, actelic gold dust is, has, an, has an advantage that the farmer, you know, their actelic gold dust, even when they have not um, shelled their maize, the farmer can come in and sprinkle um, their grain, um, their grain protectant over their shelled uh, maize to avoid any losses. So actelic gold dust contains two active ingredients, that is perimiphos and methyl and thiamethoxin. Just containing these two active ingredients, this will mean that um, actelic gold dust will have a broad spectrum. That means it will be effective against the larger grain borer, and it will be effective, um, it will be effective against the maize um, grain weevil, and even the less, lesser grain borer in maize, and even also effective to the flower um, beetle in maize. So maize is, um, actelic gold dust is only effective on maize that has reached 12.5%. So we encourage the farmer to be mindful of their moisture content. So actelic gold dust will come in packaging of 200 grams. And 200 grams will provide protection for eight bags of 50 kgs. So it's eight bags times 50 kgs. We recommend the farmer to actually weigh the grain. That in measure or grain reduity, is it per 50 kg for the grain protectant um, to be effective? Farmers have the misconception that um, three buckets um, are equivalent to 50 kgs. But when we look 
at the scale, we will see that um, three buckets is not equivalent to 50 kgs. And, and it's an estimation of 50 kgs will be around 2.5 buckets. So it is always important, you know, to work within spec to avoid the harmful effects of resistance, to avoid the harmful effects of the grain protectant not being effective. So the actelic gold dust is packaged, and when it is packaged, it comes with the cup, as you can see um, on the screen, and this um, cup um, is 25 grams. So that 25 grams will cater for 50 kgs of our grain. The advantage of actelic gold dust is that um, the farmer can wait for a week, uh, for a waiting period of around seven days. That means it is effective. Um, but we are not encouraging the farmer kuti just because it takes seven days. Then they eat um, after seven days. We recommend the farmer kuti let them um, put mushunga for chipage chawa for later. Use. And the advantage for actelic um, gold dust is that it offers protection for a period of around 12 months. So, in conclusion, I would like to say um, where there is will, there is always a way. And you know, there has been will from buying the fertilizers, there has been will, you know, from buying the chemicals, there has been will, you know, with the with the crop protection when we look at, at wheat control, insect control, and even disease control. And at post harvest, there is also a rule um, of protecting our grain using um, actelic gold dust. So definitely the farmer will get a better crop, I think. Well, thank you there, uh, Justice, for the great presentation. Reshua Gonye Tirangara uh, thanks for the solution on grain post harvest losses. Where can farmers buy actelic gold, uh, gold dust uh, justice? Okay, um, so actelic gold dust is available um, in our depots and because we are also moving with time, we now um, have an online store where the farmer can actually buy um, the actelic gold dust in the comfort of their own homes. Very convenient there uh, for, for farmers, especially on the online store. Thanks very much, uh, Justice. So we move on to our next uh, presenter, Junior Manduna. She's with Agricultural Marketing Authority. She's going to cover uh, market issues. You can go for it, Ms. Manduna. Okay, thank you very much uh, and good morning to all. My name is Junior Manduna. I'm with the Agricultural Marketing Authority. I'm going to present uh, on issues to do with the marketing of grain. I'm sure everyone was waiting for this because that's uh, where the whole issue is, not to downplay every other thing presented, but I'm sure when it comes to money issues, then uh, the farmers then start to smile. Okay, um, all right. I'm going to talk about, um, maize marketing in Zimbabwe. And uh, maize, as we all know, it is our staple crop. It's of uh, food security importance amongst other things of uh, income generation, employment creation and the like. As a result, because of the importance of uh, maize, then uh, it is therefore considered a strategic crop in Zimbabwe. So uh, because it's a strategic crop, maize, market, maize marketing in Zimbabwe is controlled. And one wonders then why is it controlled? It is controlled so that we ensure that the crop is not smuggled out of the country because um, we still need to feed the, the, the nation. So it has to be controlled for food security reasons. It also has to be uh, controlled to protect government investment in production, as well as to protect the farmer 
from unscru unscrupulous buyers who offer very low prices for the crop. Uh, maybe as a way of introduction, I will talk about um, the role of armor in grain marketing. Uh, one might then wonder who armor is. The Agricultural Marketing Authority is a um, statutory body established in terms of the AMA Act and is mandated with the overall regulation of production, marketing, and processing of agricultural products in Zimbabwe. And when it comes to maize and grains, our role as the authority is that we are supposed to, to register all agricultural value players, including you, the farmers, we also register input suppliers. We also register buyers, traders, and processors. And from time to time, we require a finishing of returns uh, for statistical and planning purposes. We also coordinate contract farming for strategic crops, such as uh, the maize that we are discussing to today. We also provide market intelligence, both on the local, and international market, as well as uh, creating market linkages for these commodities. And we are also there to uh, offer or give standards of quality, classification, grading, and packaging of all agricultural products, including maize. Then uh, in maize, we also provide that facility to raise funds for the procurement of, of grain. Then uh, for the maize value chain, there are players like the input suppliers, like our colleague who was presenting um, on chemicals. We've got uh, seed providers. We've got uh, machinery and equipment uh, uh, providers. We also have got uh, producers. We also have got traders and uh, consumers and the like. So maize in Zimbabwe is government controlled. And according to SI 145 of 2019, maize grain can only be sold uh, to the grain marketing board or to the private contractors who have funded production. And the marketing season for maize starts on the, on the 1st of April of each year. Then uh, we want to inform the farming community that the SI 145 of 2019 uh, is still effective. It remains in place. And we are talking about GMB as the buyer of choice. The government, this for this season has set a pre-producer price of 32,000 uh, RTGS per ton. And also they um, over and above the, their existing depots where the farmers can deposit their grain. They are going to be mobile buying points across the country so that we shorten the distance that the farmer has to travel in order for them to, to deposit their grain. Uh, and farmers, we are also encouraging you to open bank uh, accounts and eco cash accounts, because when you deposit your, your grains, when you deliver your, your, your grain, then payments are going to be done through bank accounts or eco cash accounts. And the GMB has also promised that it's going to pay farmers for their deliveries within 72 hours. We, as the Agricultural Marketing Authority, we are going to be having clicks stationed on our strategic buying points to assist farmers with any queries that might arise. Um, I think Wendy has also has already spoken uh, on the issue of um, moisture content. Farmers are aged to get assistance from GMB to test their grains for moisture content before they even deliver their grain. This is going to be done free of charge. And also, AMA, Agritex, and Security Forces 
are going to be out there to ensure the enforcement of the statutory instrument so that farmers uh, are protected from unscrupulous illegal um, buyers of maize. And also, as we are aware, the, there's been uh, the Fumvuda um, program in place, as well as the command agriculture. So we are saying all grain should go to grain marketing board. Chibagechese, and it Chibagechese Vari, Mitrukukukuru, Zirai, Kutingachi, Deliverwe, Ku GMB. Kanapane, if there are those who had been contracted by private players, they are still allowed under the SI 145 of 2019 to sell to the private players. Otherwise, it's going to, it's illegal for any other dealer, any other trader to go and buy this maize from, from the farmers. Um, there's going to be, uh, there is a database of farmers who, were, who benefited under the, the Fumvuza program. And we, we as AMA together with Agritex are going to be monitoring um, the deliveries uh, of grains. So basically we are saying because maize is a controlled product, it is supposed to be delivered to the GMB. GMB. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Junior, for uh, that great uh, presentation. We like the uh, mobile buyer points arrangement that you said uh, will be launched soon. I think it's a very, very convenient for farmers. And also the fact that GMB will try to pay within 72 hours. So we also thank AMA for the initiatives uh, that protects uh, farmers from unscrupulous buyers. Reminds me of, uh, of this case that was posted in, uh, in social media platforms where a farmer was duped after he met a buyer on, uh, on, on, on Facebook. So farmers, uh, let's uh, work together with the authorities. It will actually protect our, our investments. Thanks again, uh, Junior, for that uh, great presentation. Normally, farmers, we think of marketing as the last thing. But actually, in our farm business planning, marketing should be the first thing because it is actually marketing that drives production. So our production should be market-driven. Thanks again, uh, Junior, for, 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 for the great presentation. So now we go into our question and answer uh, session. Uh, we have a few questions in uh, in the chat group. Uh, one of the questions here is to, is is to justice. I think uh, it's saying where can one buy moisture checker instrument uh, for maize? Okay, uh, I don't know who can take that one. Maybe justice or Wendy. Thank you. I'll take it. So the moisture meters uh, in Zimbabwe as we have been going around, they are difficult to find in Zim. Most people who have them are buying from South Africa or importing from other countries, but South Africa is the nearest country where you can get one. And uh, it will range in price from um, about 150 to about $300, depending on the sophistication of the, of the moisture meter that you will be buying. But just to say that GMB, I'm sure Madam can allude to that, is ready and can assist with testing of, uh, of, of samples of grain to, to give you an indication of the moisture level that you are in. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for, for taking that, Wendy. Then uh, the next question here, it's saying, uh, where, how much is Actelic? Uh, thank you very much. So Actelic um, Gold Dust is going for um, three US dollars for the 200 grain um, bottle. Uh, thanks, uh, Justice. And uh, Justice, you said it protects grain for how long? It, it protects grain for 12 months for a year. Ah, okay, okay. No, that's great for an investment of uh, of three US dollars. And it covers how many bags? Uh, it covers eight bags, which are weighing 50 kgs. Okay, sorry, there's another one here. Is how do I apply the gold dust in a granary? What are the measures? Okay, okay. 
Um, so, so you will see that um, the greenery has um, a different, you know, um, approach as opposed, you know, to to our um, to our smallholder um, farmer. So um, the farmer should always um, be mindful. They should check, you know, um, um, how much grain, you know, the, the 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 quantity which is going to, you know, which is going to enter into our greeneries, and they can always um, calibrate um, using um, the, the the scale that um, um, for fifty kgs you would need um, twenty five um, grain. Ah, okay, great. Uh, thanks for that. Are there any laws that restrict me from keeping maize for my uh, family consumption? Uh, th thank you about that question. There are no laws that will prevent one from keeping for, for their family consumption. Uh, but under the Fumvodza program, there was one plot which was specifically for the household food security and another one specifically for the GMB deliveries for, for the national food security. So basically what we are saying is that you can keep uh, for your household security, but that which is meant for the national security and which is meant to be delivered to GMB should, should be, uh, that should just prevail. Ah, okay, great. Ah, okay. Thanks for taking that one. Then there's a question I'm seeing there on the screen. It's asking about the average cost of hiring a combine harvester, for example, five hectares of maize. So usually the price is usually pegged in US dollars. It depends on your area and uh, in the period that you hire the harvester because during peak times, they usually increase their prices. So it will range from about $70 to $90 per hectare to hire a combine harvester. But it's negotiable depending on where you're hiring the harvester because some are going to say, if you're going to provide fuel, then they deduct a certain um, amount. Then some are going to say, if we are going to be housed with you for a, lo a specific period, then they are going to deduct a, a certain amount. So it will depend on the service provider that you will have sought. But um, the important thing is not that uh, through the Ministry of Agriculture, they were uh, um, taking down the people who want to harvest. So the earlier you do it, you register the data through your agri-tax extension officer for your area, or you can engage such facilities from, um, from eco Pharma where they can link you up with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the people with the harvesters that are for hire. Ah, okay, great. Uh, thanks for attending to that one. Okay, a device named iPad. Uh, your hand is up. Okay, maybe it's just a, a hand that is up. Then Becky hello. says... Um, hello, hello. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Yes, my name is Mayre Sera. That's the one, that's the one with the hand up. I wanted to ask on how uh, we can apply actelic gold dust. Uh, not in a, when I say granary, it was a typing error. I meant mudara, in a dara, when the maize has not yet been shelled. Because he mentioned that we can apply that in that storage facility. How do we apply? Uh, okay, okay. Thank you for, for, for that, uh, Justice. Oh yes, so you will see um, Kutumudara, it's also important to protect um, our grain. So what the farmer can do, they can come in with no measurement, just, you know, just sprinkling over um, the actelic gold dust, the same way that would, um, like gypsum, that's the same way that they can come, um, the actelic gold dust, just to provide that protection so that we don't have any losses whilst it's needed up Okay, uh, thanks for that. I hope you have been answered there. I've been answered, thank you. Sure. Then another question here is, uh, how is how much is the KO2 shaler? That's for Tonderai. Oh, it was a question about the price. It's going for 5,800. 
Okay, five thousand eight hundred, and um, uh, it's it's a, it's a, it's it's worth the investment, uh, considering the speed uh, and also the convenience. Yeah. Actually, in terms of labor reduction, it reduces labor by yes. almost fifty percent. Oh yes, correct. Then uh, I think that's all we had. Uh, okay, so uh, once again. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, farmers, for joining this uh, webinar. And we have recorded the webinar, and after editing, we'll upload it to our YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe to the YouTube <coughs> channel. We have posted a link to the channel uh, in the chat uh, section. So I would, uh, would like to thank uh, all the presenters, Wendy uh, from Sidco, uh, and also. Uh, Justice from ZFC, thank you very much for your presentation. And Junior Manduna from uh, Agricultural Marketing Authority, we appreciate. And Tony Rai from Julius, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we've posted a link to our agribusiness talk groups as well in the chat group uh, where we discuss farm business issues. So be free, uh, just click that link for instructions on how you join, it's free. So we'll end uh, the meeting uh, now and I uh, will post more information on the upcoming webinars in the groups. Thank you very much uh, and uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you.